This is Mid-Atlantic Women in Agriculture's Wednesday webinar, Deciding on a Business Structure. Our presenters today are Ashley Ellickson, University of Maryland, and Paul Goerner, University of Maryland. A special thank you to our sponsors, Mid-Atlantic Farm Credit, Delaware Department of Agriculture, Maryland Department of Agriculture, and the USDA. All upcoming presentations, along with all archived webinars, can be found at our website. Thank you for listening. So today we're going to talk a little bit about business entity selection, what they are, and how they kind of play into the farm operation. So going into it a little bit, I think it's not working. Um, so Ashley and I are with the Ag Law Education Initiative. This is a collaboration between the Carey School of Law at Baltimore, um, University of Maryland College Park, where we're located at, and then UMES on the Eastern Shore. And we're funded through um, a university initiative called Empower. And yes, if you have questions, please type them in the chat pod. Um, we will try to pay attention to them as we go along. Um, we have a website at umaglaw.org. We're on Twitter. Um, we have someone, Neha Suri, is going to be tweeting out stuff as we talk today, so um, um, you can follow us there. We're on Facebook. Um, email account, if you miss our emails, um, that will get to one of us. Um, <coughs> we are funded through Empowering the State. And I'm going to have to take a button. It's not working. Um, this is a collaboration between College Park and Baltimore to sort of bring programs together. Um, you can find out more about it there. As a part of this project, um, the Ag Law Project, and then Crop Insurance, which I'm a part of, we have this website, the Ag, the Maryland Risk Management Education blog. It's at aglaw.umd.edu. You can sign up for updates from it. A lot of what we talk about with business entities, we try to put stuff up there to focus on that. And the disclaimer for this, we are attorneys, so please, none of this is going to be legal advice. I'm glad we're all good with that. So to kind of get started with this topic, uh, my fancy little table did not appear on this one, which is really disappointing. But Victoria has this online, so you'll be able to see it. I had a table up here, um, and what it showed is basically the idea is that in Maryland, looking at the census of ag, and it's not really a Maryland problem, it's a U.S. problem. Most farms are set up in some sort of um, sole enterprise situation. We're going to talk about what a sole, sole enterprise is. And we see very little of farms set up in some sort of business structure. And what we're going to talk about is some of the value that comes with setting the farm up as a business structure. So why do you want to use a business entity? A lot of the common reasons are it potentially helps you limit your liability. What we're going to talk about with a lot of the business structures is there's potentially ability to limit your liability. And by limiting your liability, what we mean is separating out personal liability from business liability. So if your business slash farm does something wrong, it's not you know hitting your house, your car, you know kids' um, college saving funds, and stuff like that. It's limiting the liability to specifically what's in the farm, the equipment, any um, farm business accounts, stuff like that. The other reason to look at these is it allows the farm slash business to continue on um, for generations down the road. It's, they're essentially estate planning tools as we talk about. The common structures we're going to talk about, there's one not in there that we're going to talk about that really isn't a structure, which is sole proprietorships. Um, but we have partnerships, which can be classified out as general or limited. We have limited liability companies, corporations, cooperatives. And then one for Maryland, um, for anyone outside of Maryland, this sort of business structure exists in most states. The rules sort of change depending on the state, which is a family farm business. So. We're going to talk specifically about Maryland's, but you can check with your state and probably a similar type of business organization structure exists in those states. Um, 
So the first one we're going to talk about, which is where the vast majority of farms were, if my fancy table had shown up, I should have checked that yesterday when I got all cocky when I got the presentation posted a day early. Um, um, the vast majority, over 90% of farms around the country are set up as sole proprietorships. And what this basically is, it's the simplest business structure. It's created by basically one person. If you have more than one person involved in it, you have a partnership, and we're going to talk about those in the next slides. Um, and you basically do this by just going out and declaring yourself a business. You don't have to file any fancy paperwork with the state. You go out and set your business up, and you do it. Um, the advantages of this, the best advantage is typically the owner of the company typically has full managerial control of the entire business. You don't have to work with the board of directors. You don't have to work with partners. You get to make all the decisions. So you are, you know, actuality the decider when you do this. But when we talk about other business structures, you can set other business structures up to where you have this sort of control as well. Um, what are the disadvantages of it? Well, it ends at the owner's death. So whenever the owner passes away, the business sort of goes away with it. It can be continued on sort of, um, by a, su a successing generation, but it's not the same business in reality, because in reality, all the goodwill, all the credit, everything is built up with that one individual. So when that individual goes away, all of that goes away with the business. It's not the business developing it, it's the owner developing it. It also has a limited source of funds it can use to capitalize the business. So it's limited to just your personal assets and borrowed capital. You really can't go out and get people to invest in the company as you might want with other business structures because there's no way to give them really interest in the business. And once you start giving interest in a sole proprietorship, you start creating some of the other business entities we're going to talk about. Um, and there's no opportunity to shield assets um, from liability. So if for some reason the farm does something, you know, tractor is involved in an accident going down the road, um, there is no way to shield the, the family home and other stuff from potential liabilities that could exist or, you know, happen as the business is running its course. And please, if you have questions, um, type them in the chat box. The next one is partnerships, and these come in two forms. We're going to have a general partnership and a limited partnership. So we'll start with the simplest first with a general partnership. And this is going to be similar to a sole proprietorship, but this is basically the, you know, the sole proprietorship of two or more people. Um, it basically is pretty simple to start. You just go out and declare yourself a partnership. You may or may not have some agreement between the partners. We would hope you would have an agreement in it. Agreement. And same thing with a sole proprietorship. You're not limiting um, your liabilities. So it's not just limited to business assets. It's going to be, um, you know, personal assets will be at risk as well. And it's not just you know, the partner who causes the accident to happen, whose personal assets are at the risk, it's all the partner's personal assets are at the risk. So you really have to know who you're in business with and who you're dealing with when you get into a general partnership and have a lot of trust with that other partner. Um, each partner shares in ownership and management, so everyone owns equally in it, regardless of how they pay into the company. Everyone is equal in the company. So everyone has an equal ownership stake, an equal stake in management. Um, any partner can make a decision that's binding on the other partners. Um, it dissolves at the death of a partner, or it potentially can be dissolved when the partners call it quits. So there's not a lot of continuity with a general partnership. Limited partnerships, on the other hand, have some continuity to them. Um, they require at least one general partner and one limited partner. Um, a general partner is going to be the same that we talked about over here, um, where they're just a general partnership, so they share equally in management and ownership. But a limited partner is just going to be an investor in the company. And here we're looking at something where it's a little more sophisticated. You actually do have to go out and file something with the state you're in to do this, and you have to have something in your name that says it's 
a limited partnership to be valid. So typically it requires LP in it or you know limited partnership in the name. Uh, and the limited partners are going to be the investors in the company. So they can invest in the company um, and their um, risk in the company is only their investment. So if you know the company goes broke, they don't lose everything. They're not on the hook for all the business liabilities, business debts that may have come in place. They're only on the hook for their investment. So if they invest 50 bucks, they lose 50 bucks. Um, the general partners in this case are still going to be at risk for personal assets. I think that is my last slide, and now I'm going to turn it over to Ashley to talk about corporations and kind of walk us through the other business entities. All right, so I will take it from here, and I'm going to go ahead and start off with corporations. Um, so my first slide, so what is a corporation exactly? A corporation is a legal entity separate and distinct from its owners. So when Paul discussed limiting liability earlier, this is one of the major benefits of a corporation. Um, it's completely separate from you personally or anyone else um, that m might be an owner of this business. Um, so it's owned by its shareholders who are individuals, um, other business organizations or both. And when I talk about other business organizations, you could actually have a limited partnership be an owner in a corporation. So if you have several types of businesses going on on your farm, say you have um, either a, a meat production or you have laying hens, but you also grow vegetables, and maybe you want them to be two separate entities, but one entity can actually be an owner in the other entity. So this is something that a corporation allows for. Um, so features of a corporation, the ease in which it, real property can be transferred. And this is important when you start to think about um, estate planning. So if the owner wanted to transfer the property over time, maybe to his children or grandchildren, he would need to transfer an interest in the property over time, which would incur transaction costs and complicate title. But with a farm corporation, you can simply convey individual shares. So we talked about in this slide that um, there are actually shareholders. So in the corporation, you can convey shares rather than over time trying to create these transactions that, um, that will eventually transfer property over to maybe another generation or another individual. So say if you're wanting to get out of the business eventually um, and want to slowly convey over to a partner or a younger person, um, and you're kind of mentoring them, this is also something to consider when thinking about corporations as an entity, business entity. Um, there's also limited liability coverage, which I just talked about. You can only be held accountable for the amount of your investment in the corporation. So whatever you actually own or have put into the corporation is the only asset that you can be liable for. So if you are a 25% owner, that's all you can be liable for, um, and so on. And then owners only pay tax on their salary, and then the corporation is taxed, but at a lower corporate tax rate. So there are two separate taxing issues when it comes to a corporation. Something to consider when, when you're thinking about taxes and which, corporate, which business entity might be a good fit for you and what you have going on in your life as well. Always good to talk about taxes. Tax season, right? April 15th, Friday. <laughs> um, disadvantages of corporations, they can be very complex. So we just talked about shareholders and possibly other businesses being an owner of a corporation. Um, it can get a little complex, and there can also be costly administrative fees because what comes along with corporations is also paperwork. Um, and someone has to file those um, that paperwork and someone has to do the taxes and and things like that so those fees can accumulate and then again the tax requirements you're taxed twice you're taxed on um, the profits from the company and at least it's at that corporate rate which is a little bit better than individual rates and then um, you're also taxed when you pay dividends and then this 
corporations are also hev heavily regulated. So where you see something that's extremely complex and that requires a lot of paperwork and maybe some complicated tax issues, you're going to see more heavily something that corporate that business entity is going to be more highly regulated. So moving on, um, limited liability corporations, LLCs. I feel like this is a pretty common um, in terms of, of farm businesses. I do see these a lot. Um, so what is a limited liability corporation? A hybrid of a corporation and a partnership. So Paul talked about partnerships, and I just spoke about corporations. So the limited liability corporation is going to be a mix of both of these. Limited liability, but is treated as a non-corporate entity for tax purposes. So there's the hybrid part. Features of an LLC. So any entity can be an owner. We talked about this with corporations. It creates room for creativity for farms with separate operations, like I talked about before. So again, if you're a poultry farmer and you also grow soybeans and corn, you might have those business entities separate and one be an owner and the other. You can do that here with an LLC as well. Um, they're less restrictive in corporations and they also require less paperwork. However, I'm going to dive in here in a minute and talk about the LLC operating agreement. And even though it can, can require a little bit more work on your end, it actually benefits you in the long run. Um, operating agreement. So basically, an operating agreement for an LLC is going to set forth the structure of the LLC. Um, it's the main governing document of the LLC above all other documents, and since it's considered a contract, it also must be agreed upon by all participating parties. So if you are um, decide to form an LLC with you and your partner or you and two other people, you're all going to want to sit down and agree on what this operating agreement says and what types of things can you agree on. Um, you can set out who is doing the managing, who is doing the decision making, um, and this is going to ease conflict in the future or so in theory we hope. Um, obviously things will come up and maybe people disagree, but at least this can set out maybe some standards that you that the partners agree on. Um, and it can also dictate what happens in the currents of a death or a sell-by instance when someone wants to get out of the business. And again, this is something to really consider for estate planning reasons. Um, if you have maybe some elderly people that are owners, this is something that they might want to consider putting in their LLC operating agreement. And then, and additionally, maybe at some point, um, someone, one of the partners decides that they don't want to farm anymore, that it's really not what they want to do, and they want to move to the city and maybe pursue other, other things in life. So if you have a sell-by instance, this kind of basically creates somewhere where you can go to ease that, um, that debacle. So it doesn't get like out of hand or, um, you know, communication stuff doesn't come up later. So anyways, the LLC can um, operating agreement can be a very, very good tool if used correctly. So disadvantages of LLCs, self-employment tax, um, that's a high tax rate. It's a higher tax rate than your corporate tax. Um, your tax on the profits from the LLC. And then, again, the LLC operating agreement. It can, again, also be a disadvantage because although everyone agrees on it, maybe everyone's not actually abiding by the agreement. So maybe everyone agreed that someone would do the real managing and maybe there was going to be voting of some sort and those actually aren't being done according to the operating agreement. So, again, it can be a disadvantage. And, okay, so moving on to cooperatives. And this is something that doesn't come up all that often, um, but it does actually come up a lot in agriculture. So what is a cooperative? A farm, business, or other organization owned and run jointly by its members. They share in the profits. They have a common goal, common marketing scheme. Um, and it's typically a cro close group of members geographically. For example, my family has a dairy in Arizona, and they're actually part of a co-op based in Arizona. So them, among other dairies in the area, all have decided to be part of this cooperative, and it does have its benefits um, 
as well as its disadvantages, which we're going to go through now. So features, you can choose to incorporate or not. So you form the cooperative, you can also decide to either create it into an LLC or a corporation or any other business structure that we've been talking about. But typically the corporation or the LLC are most typical. Um, all parties in the cooperative share in both the expenses and the risks. Um, the purchasing power, this is one actually benefit of a cooperative. The larger group you are, the more purchasing power you have and the more power you have in the marketplace, really. Um, you can create one brand, so that'll create maybe a greater exposure than if you were to try to do it on your own, from your own farm. And then again, you're not double taxed here. You're taxed once on income. Some disadvantages. You have slower cash flow, because there's a lot more to do up front um, in investing in the cooperative. And then the disadvantage can be generic branding. So if there's something that you really love about your farm and you really want to brand on it, if you're part of a cooperative, unfortunately, you're sharing the branding with all parties. So you can't really create your own distinct brand. Um, and then the lack of membership and participation. So this comes with, I think, many types of different groups of people. You all come together, you have one common goal, but of course you have some people participating more than others. More people that are putting in more work, they're doing more of the activities up front, trying to get the branding going, and then you have the other people that are benefiting from all of this, but they're really not doing as much. They're just gonna sit back and watch you do it all. So you can have those types of issues. And then moving on to the family farm business. So like Paul talked about in the beginning, family farm business rules differ between state to state. So I'm going to talk about what a family farm is in Maryland. And if you happen to be in Delaware or Virginia or Pennsylvania, feel free to email me and I can go ahead and send you what your state specifically says. But for today's purposes, I'm going to go over Maryland. So Maryland Code Corporations and Associations Section 209 says a family farm must encompass each of the following to be considered a family farm. So the code lays out four distinct rules. A domestic entity which owns or within one year after filing articles of incorporation, articles of organization, certificate of partnership, will own or take control of property qualifying for agricultural use under the tax property article. Number two, the entity must own only agriculturally or residentially assessed real property and personal property used for agricultural purposes, or they can also own only personal property that's used for agricultural or agricultural marketing purposes. Three, the entity must also be controlled, managed, and operated by one individual who has an equity interest in the entity, or two or more individuals who have an equity interest in the entity and who share its assets and earnings. And number four, is declared in a charter provision to be a family farm and has no assets other than those described in item two. So that's gonna be two on this page here. So to be considered a family farm in Maryland, you have to be all four of those. Um, advantages of being a family farm. Reduced fees, if your farm operates as a limited liability partnership, you must file an annual personal property tax um, report with the State Department of Assessments and Taxation. If you are a family farm, I believe you are reduced $100 of that fee. Um, if your farm is a limited liability corporation in Maryland, it must file an annual report and personal property tax return each year and pay a fee of $300 in addition to any personal property tax. And again, that fee is going to be reduced $100. I see Angela has a question on number two. So number two, the entity must own only agriculturally or residentially assessed real property and personal property used for agricultural purposes, or you can own personal property that's used for agricultural purposes. So basically it's just differentiating between you can only own agricultural, agriculturally or residentially assessed real property or personal property, but they both have to be used for agricultural prop, uh, purposes. And if you have further questions, feel free to email me about that. Um, and then again, so moving back to the advantages, um, every corporation, LLC or LLP or limited partnership doing business in Maryland must file an annual personal property report 
um, by April 15th each year. And again, that's reduced from $300 to $100 for family farms. So all of these fees that are required to be paid by business entities, if you have that charter stating that you are a family farm, all of those fees are going to be reduced. And again, you have to meet those four requirements in Maryland that I went over to be considered a family farm. Um, picking a business entity, I will go ahead and hand it back over to Paul, and he's going to go over these. Let me unmute my mic. That would probably work better. <laughs> okay. So picking a business entity. Oh, a Ashley, you want to handle Angela's question before I get started? Sure. Um, as far as what the code says, it's only basically reductions in fees, not property tax. But I would definitely talk to your accountant about that. They wouldn't probably know more. So picking the right business in it, T. So at this point, how many of you feel like this? I'm impressed the picture would work, but the simple chart would not earlier. Um, so picking the right business entity, there is going to be no simple answer in this. There's going to be a lot of factors involved in it. You may be hearing one on this webinar that you think, oh, this is going to work perfect for me in my situation, but when you go to put it in practice and start working with an accountant and an attorney, it's not actually going to work for you. So what do you need to start thinking about it? <clears throat> well, some of the things you need to start thinking about and making a decision are, you know, are you okay with two separate bank accounts? And that seems kind of weird because probably many of you have a you know, business account and a personal account. But in some cases, if you're not ready for that, you may not want a business entity. It may not be right for you. Um, and a lot of the checklists I've looked at, that's actually the number one thing they start discussing with you is if you're not okay with two separate bank accounts and you really don't want a business organization structure, you want to continue to be a sole proprietorship. Um, do you want to protect personal assets from business liabilities, not with liability, business liabilities? Do you want to protect personal assets from business liabilities? How many people want to have some sort of protection to where if the business is involved in some sort of accident, some liability, um, that your house, your personal assets are not going to be taken. I think most people would raise their hands if I could see a show of hands. Um, and do you want the ability to grow the business by taking outside capital? There may be ways to grow the business beyond just taking um, bank loans, um, looking for investor income. There's a lot of people interested in ag at this period of time. And there may be ways to grow your farm by taking outside capital that allows them to get an ownership stake in the business um, in return for the capital. So that may be something that you're thinking about. That may be something uh, along the lines that you're wanting to deal with. You know, probably. So as my picture says, you know, keep calm. Trust me, I'm a lawyer. Please don't trust me for that, any of those reasons. Um, if you've answered yes to potentially to any of those questions, and potentially, yes, you're going to want to consider an LLC, a corporation, and I should have put partnership in there as well because it still has some valid uses today. But if you've answered yes to any of those, there's potentially a need for you to consider you know, an LLC, a corporation, or a partnership. Why are you going to do that? And how are you going to make that decision? A lot of it's going to depend on you know talking with your accountant and talking to an attorney. I will get back to that question in a second. Um, before making the decision, um, you're going to want to talk to your accountant um, and attorney to sort of walk through this because there's probably going to be a lot of issues. You're going to own assets. You're going to have um, different property. Um, you're going to have bank accounts. You're going to have different issues that are going to have to be dealt with to see how do we migrate you from probably the sole proprietorship into this um, business organization structure. 
I put up there, Farm Commons has a good checklist. They have a deal you can walk through that kind of helps you decide um, what business entity you want to utilize. I've been looking at some other websites, University of Mar or Maryland, University of Minnesota's um, extension website has a web has a fact sheet up on choosing a business entity and sort of walking through some of those decisions. And the biggest area for them is sort of looking at, you know, how do you want to limit personal liability, business liability from personal liability? We also have a fact sheet available that Ashley and I wrote um, late last year when Ashley's last name was still Newhall. Apparently we forgot to update that on the slide. Um, but this is going to provide you a lot more detail on the topics and you can find it at that link there. And Thank you for watching our archived presentation of our Wednesday webinar. If you would like to see more archived Wednesday webinars, please visit our YouTube channel. Or to find a schedule of upcoming live webinars, visit our website.